Shall we uh, continue with the uh, Afrikaanderwijk? So what I want to um, um, tell you now is basically the, um, uh, the, the questions that we have for this week and the background of that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how, um, what we know about Afrikaanderwijk, how it came into existence and uh, what issues there are at this moment connected to uh, its um, uh, development and uh, especially with migration. So um, what you see here is a, uh, a drawing of uh, the Afrikaanerwijk. Um, I'm not sure, do, do you all have an idea of where it is on the map? Um, so what you see here is largely non-existing uh, anymore. I mean, the part in the north, that's the uh, Wilhelmina Kade, Kop van Zuid. And, uh, but this triangle is basically the Afrikaanerwijk. And this is when it was just being built. So it's probably 1905. Um, here you see uh, Het Gemaal. Uh, remember that? We'll be seeing that later on. So Het Gemaal is the, connected to the polder structure. So also this is a um, uh, uh, former polder. It used to be agriculture before the development of the harbor. And uh, in this building, there's the, the pumps keeping it, uh, keeping it dry. Um, it, as you see, it's, com it's immediately adjacent to the, uh, to the harbor uh, basins. And it was meant for the harbor workers to, uh, to live in. So the, the way it went then, uh, back then, the municipality put out the, the pattern of the streets. Uh, put in the infrastructure, uh, both the streets, water, uh, sewage, uh, and um, this kind of polder infrastructure. And then there were plots that were sold to uh, different, well, you couldn't say developers, builders, who then uh, built cheap housing and uh, rented it out to, uh, to workers. It was started around 1903, uh, the, the whole neighborhood. And in 1901, uh, there was a, a visitor in, um, in, in the Netherlands, which was Paul Kruger. Uh, and that was also the time of the, the second Boer War in, uh, in South Africa. Um, and Paul Kruger was one of the, the big generals of that, uh, of that war. And um, well, hard to imagine, but uh, people strongly sympathized with um, the Boers at that time, because the Boer War was uh, the, the war of the, the ancestors of the Dutch, the Boers, um, against the English. So the, and the Dutch uh, took sides in this uh, war, supported the Boers, and um, Paul Kruger was uh, well welcomed as a, a respected uh, visitor. Of course, also one of the uh, well, f the fact of the, the Boers were also strongly supporting the uh, apartheid and developing that uh, after, uh, the, uh, after the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but the names have uh, re remained the same. Half of the names in uh, the Afrikaanerwijk is named after a place in South Africa, uh, like uh, Pretoria, Transvaal, uh, Goede Kaap. And the other half is named after the, the generals and the, the militaries, uh, so the Boers. Cronier, Kruger, De Wet. Interesting is that um, you can see that all these black lines on the map, um, they were of, uh, uh, they were a big influence on the urban plan, and they are the, the lines of the, of the railways. So part of the infrastructure of the harbor, and uh, Bouter will, will talk about it more uh, tomorrow. Um, of course, the harbor, this infrastructure, was the raison d'etre of this whole area, and they were put in first, and then after that, the, the streets and everything was sort of modeled uh, to these uh, railway lines. So, for instance, you can see that little, uh, the pinnacle of the triangle, and you can see the, the railway lines uh, going through, and all the buildings, the housing was modeled to the, the flowing railway lines. And even when they were put, taken out in the 60s and 70s, 
of course, the buildings still had that, uh, still had that shape. But there's also one big uh, element that has changed, uh, which you can see here. There's this, in Dutch you call it an emplacement, uh, uh, which is the place where uh, trains are being parked, basically. So you have a lot of trail uh, uh, lines next to each other, a huge area which uh, formed the eastern barrier of the Afrikanerwijk, uh, up to the rest of the harbors of uh, Feyenoord. This whole part has been, um, uh, the, the railway lines has, have been taken out, it's not used anymore and it, is, it became part of the extension area of the Afrikanerwijk. And this is also uh, what we'll, uh, we'll see at this afternoon. Um, again, this uh, is an area that was uh, defined by migration right from the beginning. So people who moved into the housing in uh, Afrikanerwijk, they came from uh, the countryside in the Netherlands. Uh, but right next door, there's the area of Katerdrecht, where the, the Chinese community was housed. And the harbors, um, also the Wilhelmina Pier, the whole Kop van Zuid, uh, was very strongly uh, defined by uh, these migration flows. Uh, people who came from the Balkan, from Ukraine, uh, Jewish communities from Russia, uh, Italians, Sicilians, everybody m moved um, uh, to Rotterdam or Antwerp um, to take the boat to the US. And of course, uh, well, many people uh, uh, left, but also some people wanted to leave, but never did. For instance, the, uh, there's this famous um, cinema, Tushinsky, in, um, uh, the Jewish Tushinsky, who came from uh, uh, Russia to Rotterdam to leave for the US, but he never left. And he started cinemas, first in Rotterdam and then afterwards also in Amsterdam, and that is still one of the most uh, famous uh, cinemas in Amsterdam. So there's also this spin-off, you could say, of uh, uh, of migration. There's a whole economy attached to it, an economy of hotels and, and shops, etc. And there is uh, a sort of a spillover of migrants who actually stay in the city. I have a, maybe a very obvious question, but why is it called Afrikaner? Well, it was for the more like the Brabant people moving into Africa? Because it was, um, uh, um, they chose out of respect for the Boers in South Africa, the Afrikaners, uh, to uh, have all the names uh, named after um, something in uh, South Africa, and um, to uh, out of respect for the Afrikaners. Well, then I, I was talking about this, uh, the, uh, the yeah, the, the huge changes in, in the demographics in the 70s when uh, the white flight to the, to the new areas and guest workers coming in to the Afrikanerwijk with the, uh, the, the riots in Afrikanerwijk and surrounding areas as a, as a result. So it very quickly turned uh, into a migrant neighborhood and into an arrival city. Uh, interesting is that also at that time, uh, the tensions were, uh, the, uh, were taken by the, uh, by the politicians in Rotterdam uh, as a cue for new policies. And they came up with a law which resembles very much the Rotterdam uh, wet, the Rotterdam law that we have now. Uh, and they stated that they wanted to have a law for uh, all the neighborhoods, the old neighborhoods in Rotterdam, uh, saying that there should not be a number of more than 5% of migrants in a neighborhood, 5%. So it was, uh, it was around that percentage at the, at the time, and then they wanted to make it into a law, um, keeping it at that low level. But then it was um, in the legal procedures, it went to the Raad van State, so the higher uh, legal uh, office, and they um, overruled it because it was uh, discriminatory. Of course, interesting is that the Rotterdam law, um, uh, 40 years later, was um, 
m went much more uh, further, decided that um, there would be a certain percentage above which people would not be allowed into a neighborhood, um, and then that you would need a certain income uh, level to be able to move inward. So that is to limit the amount of people on welfare, for instance, in Afrikaanerwijk. So, and now it is, uh, it, it was heavy, uh, heavily debated also on a European level, but it's still uh, in existence. And um, some people actually say that these neighborhoods, like the Afrikaanerwijk, are sort of testing grounds for new laws and new policies uh, against uh, migrant communities against uh, the poorer, the weaker, um, diminishing the accessibility of the city, uh, as um, uh, Mike for, for has mentioned. And you can see that this Rotterdam law, even though it's so uh, contested, was also used in the other cities. And is now even, it, the, here it says, is the Rotterdam law being exported to um, Almelo, which is a completely different city, in the east of uh, the Netherlands, and apparently they have some um, uh, demographic issues there, so they are thinking of uh, using the same laws, uh, which you can have doubts if, it's, uh, if, if this law is legal in a, uh, in, in a general sense. So, Afrikaanerwijk and migrant areas as testing ground for new policies. I think that's a, uh, yeah, a very relevant uh, issue for, uh, for Rotterdam and these kind of uh, neighborhoods. But apart from this um, law to keep migrants at 5%, there was also another thing coming from these uh, riots, uh, which was more uh, positive, which was the urban renewal. So politicians understood that the, uh, the population in these kind of areas, in the old uh, 19th century workers' areas, uh, were uh, rightfully complaining about their uh, housing situation and that this uh, housing really needed to, uh, to improve. And they also realized that they should do that in a different way than they uh, were thinking about because these are the kind of areas that wanted that uh, were going to be demolished, and then high rises were going to be uh, built in in its place. But of course, well, of course, well, the uh, inhabitants didn't want to that to happen. They wanted to keep their house, but have it in a better shape. Um, and then the this whole urban renewal in a participative way started, and that is typically uh, something of the 70s when there was this uh, left-wing government in, in Rotterdam. Uh, the Labour Party was in, in, in charge then. And uh, architects basically took the position that they were not designers anymore, but they were uh, social workers. So they went out on the street. They went to um, mobilize people who lived there. They talked to people. They had groups. Um, and they came up with these programs that, um, uh, for the improvement of the existing uh, of the existing houses, and well, that's basically what happened. This is the same um, uh, graph that uh, drawing that you already showed. I think you did. You translate all the. Yes, yeah, Sasha did. Oh, Sasha did. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, uh, it, th this is basically the result of uh, all that participative uh, meetings, um, saying that we want a school here, we want housing, we want this, we want that. And then um, this became the program for the, uh, for the urban renewal. And one of the things um, also extended to public space, because right at that moment, uh, these streets that were uh, built, a well, now a hundred years ago, they were just streets and then full of cars that were uh, parked there. And um, part of the urban renewal was also to include more greenery, um, more space for pedestrians and uh, bicyclists and, uh, and less cars. So there was this housing and public space endeavor uh, at the same time. The worst housing was being demolished, and then new uh, buildings were being built there. And this is the kind of this is the social housing that's very typical of the 70s and beginning of the 80s. Um, 
I'm not really sure how to describe that. It's like uh, small scale, high density. Uh, it's not really architecture. It's a lot of bricks. It doesn't have a, a, a high design quality. But it was also not about uh, design or about architecture. I think architecture was also considered to be elitist in that period because it was, uh, this was all for uh, the people. And you can also see that in the way that the existing houses were being um, yeah, remodeled. And this is actually a good example. Um, the, the, the top layer was taken off, like the, the pitched roofs. And then uh, these uh, roof boxes, duck dozen, were uh, being replaced. So there would be more space on the top layer. So it was a creation of extra space. Um, but also you can see that the materials, it was usually uh, trespa. It was this uh, board material. Very cheap, very simple, um, and not low maintenance, of course. That was the, the idea, so plastic. Uh, windows and uh, trespa, so everything was about low maintenance. But it does show, it looks, uh, looks very poor. And also very strange is that you, you see 19th century houses, but uh, it's only the outside, because if you would look at how these houses are organized, it's usually uh, one door and then behind it is a walk-up flat. So it's the, the typology in the inside is a, a 60s, 70s walk-up flat uh, behind this facade of, uh, uh, of the 19th century. And of course, that causes a lot of uh, problems now and also um, yeah, is not perceived at this moment as to have a, a good quality, good housing quality neither. Um, so that was mainly 70s, beginning of the 80s. What you see here is the, of course, the ideas about urban renewal changed all the time. And the Afrikanerwijk uh, went through different phases of this urban renewal. So the first one was this of the 70s that I uh, just showed with this uh, yeah, bleak new buildings and the, the roof boxes. And then at the end of the 80s, there was this new wave in, uh, in architecture. Uh, that was the neo-modernism, and that was uh, that you can also see the traces of in uh, Afrikanerwijk. For instance, this is uh, uh, a housing uh, tower of Meccano, uh, which is uh, one of the largest offices now of uh, uh, of the Netherlands, which just started then. It's of '89. Uh, this is DKV, um, um, architects who previously worked at OMA. So it's the, it was the younger generation of architects who engaged in this uh, neo-modernism and uh, also yeah, put their mark on, uh, on the Afrikanerwijk. So like you see here, you see this closed block. That's of course the, the, the regular typology, urban planning typology of Afrikanerwijk. This is the area. Uh, where DKV put in these buildings. And of course, that is a completely different typology. Uh, uh, urban villas, as they were called. Um, uh, autonomous objects, uh, freestanding in space. So the whole idea of a, a closed building block was um, disappeared. And also, that building we'll see, it's not so very clear to see on this uh, image. It came on this, uh, this spot where also you would have two rectangular blocks. And this uh, new block is actually sort of a, a snake uh, that has a free-flowing uh, position in regarding to the street. So that's uh, all these different phases put their mark uh, on Afrikanerwijk. Um, and but one consistent factor that you can see uh, in all these different phases is uh, the effect that it had on the program of the neighborhood. So it used to be a, a, a worker's neighborhood with a lot of um, uh, work and um, a lot of uh, shops, a lot of bars. Here, for instance, you see this, this um, uh, three maps show the amount of shops. So you can see uh, during the time of the riots, 1972, there were uh, 
there was a very s strong network of, uh, of shops. This is, by the way, from the 2007 uh, report that we did, so you can also find it in there. Um, you see the main streets are very closely lined with, uh, with shops. But then after the first wave of the um, uh, urban renewal, this was what remained. And um, 2007, this was all that remained. And this is the same for uh, bars. So there was a, a, a diminishing amount of uh, extra program. It, it became a dormitory town more. So I think the urban renewal used very strongly the idea of the suburb, the suburban um, uh, specialization of, of housing, focus on housing, zoning, like uh, zone all the, the shops and uh, industry out of the neighborhood. And you see that in the urban renewal. And this is the strongest way you see it. This is all the uh, services, small shops, workspaces, uh, small-scale industry. You see that in 1972 it was a lot. Uh, and, um, well, the first phase of urban renewal took out most of it. And then uh, this is all that remains, and it's mainly services and not so much workspaces, etc. And I think that's also, uh, yeah, something that put a very strong stamp on the uh, on the change of, the, of this neighborhood and all the other neighbor, uh, neighborhoods that were part of urban renewal. And I think this is also, uh, Rotterdam is um, absolutely not unique in this. You see this in every city and probably in every country. It's the, the idea of, you know, the SIAM idea of zoning, of separating functions. That is what you uh, uh, see the results of in this, uh, in this development. These? Yeah. yeah, this is new buildings and yeah. that's, um, uh, they are services, they are offices. Uh, so uh, what you can yeah. see is that the, um, uh, the row of houses um, looking out over the harbour was uh, torn down yeah. and then a few larger offices, I think belonging to uh, housing cooperations and the, the, yeah, the, it's not the municipality but the, the local, the small municipality of uh, Feyenoord is housed there. Yeah. This I don't know but this, uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Because what you see your, that. Uh, what is your opinion about it? Of course, I'm not going to but uh, is there any. I think that's what we're going to find out. I think it's part of, actually, that's part of the mapping that we should do hmm. to see what changed. Yeah. But it's good that you mention it. Like, it, on the one hand, it's become less uh, locations for, uh, for work. And on the other hand, the, the locations that are there uh, are, have become bigger. But I don't know. After 2007, uh, we never followed up on this. Because, well, I'll talk about that later. But this was the, um, uh, this was the study, Sociologica, like a, to have a, yeah, a simple strategy for the renewal of the Afrikaanerwijk. That was the, the subtitle. And we were asked by Vestia. Vestia is um, the housing corporation that owns most of the housing, social housing stock in Afrikaanerwijk and is one of those um, housing corporations that um, through fu fusions with other and, and, and buying of other um, uh, corporations became a huge corporation uh, over the last um, 20 years. Uh, and they have about 70, 75,000 units of uh, housing. And they're all also one of those you could call uh, cowboy corporations because they had a director that was, uh, that was all about uh, larger scale, uh, acquiring more houses, acquiring more money, doing bigger projects, doing this, doing that, up to the point that it became illegal and um, that he, uh, he gambled with uh, the money from the corporation on the, in the stock exchange, uh, or he or his organization, 
at least he was uh, ousted and um, uh, he had to go to jail, basically. So, but he was our um, uh, client for this study. And they asked, um, how can we renew Afrikanerwijk, knowing that this whole train en placement uh, to the east uh, is going to be rebuilt with um, middle-class housing, with more expensive housing, uh, attracting different kinds of people, uh, and introducing this whole yeah, new layer, a new addition to the neighborhood. How can we uh, make sure that it forms part of the Afrikanerwijk, and uh, that Afrikanerwijk is also uh, connected to it, and um, uh, profits from it, so that it would also develop in a natural way. And um, I think what they would probably would have wanted, well, what we said is we need to do something, you need to do something, Vestia, uh, in the, uh, a way that is logical, in a social way. So don't go tearing down and demolishing the housing and then building more expensive things, uh, introducing all these new people, changing it completely built on what is already there. Use the existing housing stock and improve it, embellish it. Use the existing people and empower them and uh, educate them and give them chance to emancipate. Uh, look at what um, entrepreneurs there already are in the neighborhood and give them a chance to develop themselves. Um, so as to give a boost to the neighborhood themselves so that we don't import something from uh, outside the neighborhood, but that was exactly what they were uh, looking for. Um, like for instance, at that moment they had already this concept of um, Afrikaanerwijk, uh, Eetwijk, um, uh, culinary neighborhood, and they wanted to have all kinds of, because the, I think the, the, the argument was there's all these migrants living there, nobody likes migrants, but everybody likes foreign food. So let's make it into a culinary concept and have all these uh, um, yeah, exotic restaurants there. But they never looked at if there were really uh, people who wanted to do that or if there were restaurants who actually wanted to go there. So yeah, it didn't work. It became a failure. Uh, but when we said um, you need to empower those people who are already there, they were really disappointed because they wanted, they were looking for, uh, yeah, attractive cultural ideas for events, for festivals, for um, the embellishment or for exhibitions or whatever. And uh, so they were very unhappy with this uh, proposal and um, uh, immediately threw it away. So that's also why, uh, yeah, we never followed up. But what we, um, uh, I will just show you a few things of this study that I think we can use during this week. Um, this is, first of all, the situation that existed in 2007 and that shows uh, an inventory of the buildings, uh, the, the, the age of the buildings and the uh, uh, the plans also for the buildings. So what you can see here is everything dark red uh, was going to be demolished, has been demolished uh, by now. And here you can also see Twebels, uh, Straat, which is this highly contested street that you probably have heard of, uh, that was in the news so much, um, that has been, well, they are, develop, uh, they are demolishing it uh, as we speak. Um, and at that moment in time, it was original building, but they were looking at, they were researching the technical state of these uh, buildings. And of course, they concluded uh, that um, it was in a very bad technical state and needed to be demolished. I mean, that's also, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be too um, suspicious, but if corporations say, well, we have to investigate the technical state, you know that they want to demolish it. It always, they will always find something. Um, let's see. Then, um, the darkest color is national heritage. So there's a few buildings that are, um, especially this one, used to be a school and is now a mosque. 
uh, is national uh, uh, heritage. And um, Rotterdam heritage, that's also a few buildings like this one, Het Gemaal, uh, and one over there, which they call the castle. Uh, so that's, there's a few um, monuments which are part of this, uh, of this area. And the other, um, I think, the conclusion that you can draw from this is that uh, the, the street pattern is still from the beginning of Afrikaanerwijk, but the uh, amount of uh, buildings, well, hardly so. And I think by now it uh, it's must be even less. Uh, so uh, all, this color is uh, the original, but you can see that most dates from after 75. Yeah, and this is the, the map that we want to use, we also printed it, that we want to use in this afternoon. Uh, because I think what we did here is to um, map all the different functions that were uh, still there. So we just noted in every uh, shop, every ground floor, uh, what it was, if it was sports, a snack bar, a ho hotel, I'm not sure if it's their hotel, restaurants, sex shops, travel agencies, etc. And I think there's probably been a change because, yeah, I'll get to that. So w I think we should probably start with an update uh, of, um, of this map. Uh, and in that way, it's also a nice way of just going around and uh, having a detailed look at all the streets. Uh, but we can probably already uh, draw some conclusions from that in the afternoon uh, because well, unless everything is the same, but I don't expect that. Um, just to show you a, a few reasons, like, um, of course, we're, we're now uh, complaining and um, uh, discussing all the projects that have been uh, done by Vestia and uh, the sort of general tendency of um, tearing down social housing and putting in more expensive middle class or even more expensive housing. But this is the situation in, uh, yeah, just before 2007 that explains this, uh, the, this, this tendency a little bit. Um, Afrikaanerwijk, uh, so we have a, a set of these uh, data uh, maps and they are also in, um, uh, in, the, in the report, so you can look them up. But here you can see the um, balance between uh, migrants and, and Dutch people. And as you can see, um, the, this darker color is uh, where the uh, migrants are more than uh, Dutch people. And this whole area uh, consists of those kind of uh, majority migrant areas. And Afrikaanerwijk is one of them. There's about 9,000 people living there and 13% uh, Surinamese, 5% Antillian, 3% Cape Verdean, 34% of Turkish people, and 13% of Moroccan, and then 16% of Dutch. So you can see at that point it was a very diverse uh, neighborhood, um, which, well, it's not really a problem, but what was a problem is that uh, they were also, it was also a hub of uh, poor, uneducated, uh, unemployed people. And that, well, this is still about, here you can see the um, uh, demographic makeup of Rotterdam. And here you can see the uh, Afrikaanerwijk. So you can see that it was also within Rotterdam, it was not really representative for the whole city. It was uh, uh, really a concentration of, uh, mainly Turkish and Moroccan uh, inhabitants. So it was considered unbalanced. And then here you can see the, the percentage of uh, households below the uh, poverty line. So it was doing very badly. 27% uh, of the households in Afrikaanerwijk were below the poverty line. So um, with an average income of 14,000 uh, uh, euro. So that's really not a lot at all. So very poor and uh, yeah, 
quite hopeless uh, situation, especially if you would regard uh, the amount of um, unemployed people. So it was 24% in Afrikaner. -like. Also, within the, uh, if you compare it to the other neighborhoods which were surrounding Afrikaner, -like, it was still doing bad. And you had the situation that um, in some families there were three generations after each other but they were completely unemployed that had never worked in their life. So there was, uh, this is one thing that you could say about this idea of arrival city. Uh, on the one hand, an arrival city like Afrikanerijk, you can regard it as a, a positive thing because it um, offers all the sort of necessary networks and amenities that which you need as a newcomer. On the other hand, uh, it sometimes also provides nothing else. So it, that it becomes not only an arrival city, but also a stay city with um, uh, people who are not able to go out and who uh, don't see anything else than uh, poverty and unemployment uh, uh, around, uh, around them, and uh, which yeah, is sort of a stranglehold uh, which becomes a static situation. And uh, that is how uh, Afrikanerwijk was considered at that moment, around 2007, uh, as well as the neighborhoods surrounding it. Um, well, then this is what they would say, uh, the, some other negative factors. This is the score that children would have uh, at elementary school, like um, how they would score to go to um, uh, the secondary school, it was lower than the average, and um, and this shows the sort of disbalance, if you will, um, between rental and uh, f uh, and owner-occupied housing. So, 85% of housing in Afrikanerwijk is social housing. So you can see it was a concentration of, uh, of factors that were uh, considered to be really negative and also in hindsight that uh, I don't think it's only a right-wing uh, thing to look at those factors as a, as a limiting uh, conglomerate. It actually has uh, a number of negative uh, influences on its uh, population. And this I'm going to skip. So um, here you see the, the map, the new map of South, Rotterdam South, from that period, 2007. And as you can see, there's a concentration of new projects in and around Afrikaanderwijk. Uh, to the east side, there's this, uh, all these new buildings called Parkstad, uh, Park City. Uh, and um, there was uh, also this demolishing and uh, new building uh, of the northern part of Afrikanerwijk. So a lot going on there. And of course that had to do everything with um, the um, developments in the, in the area. And it was uh, the, the reason why, um, I'm not ex exactly sure when this started, but it was also around 2007, uh, the big national project of uh, Rotterdam South which was a, a cooperation between housing corporations, the municipality, developers, etc., to um, improve the whole of, uh, well, not the whole of Rotterdam South, all these areas uh, that were poor and undeveloped and uh, unemployed. And it, this is still going on. But as you probably know, there is this, uh, the Kop van Zuid development. I'm sure that you've been to uh, Lantara Venstor or uh, Phoenix Food Factory or one of those other areas. Um, this is um, like Aarhus invested in, uh, in the student population from the 20s. Uh, in the 80s already there was this new bridge, the Erasmus Bridge, that was creating a second center of the city on, on south. And it slowly trickled down. First, uh, Wilhelmina Pier was developed. And now, uh, this is the, uh, so this is Wilhelmina Pier. Now, slowly, this is um, uh, moving downwards 
Now, Katerdrecht, that we, I showed you before as the place where Chinatown was, uh, was based and where all the, the hookers were based and where the gambling was based. And now it's this really expensive uh, uh, area with uh, all new buildings that uh, yeah, introduces a completely different uh, atmosphere. And Afrikanerwijk is just uh, around here. So it was said before that Afrikanerwijk used to be very far away psychologically, but in fact it is really close. So uh, the effect is that Katerdrecht uh, used to look like that on the, on the left, uh, and now um, it looks like that on the right. So also the, you can see that the, the, the sort of people that it attracts uh, are completely different. Um, and that is, I think, what also, is that also what is going to happen in Afrikanerwijk? That is, a, that is a question that I think we should look into this week. Because the first signs are already there. And uh, I'm not sure, but it could be that uh, Katerdrecht and Afrikanerwijk are sort of the front line of, um, of gentrification. And uh, that it would be uh, a development that we could expect to happen everywhere in the city. And uh, we know that these kind of bars don't exist anymore. Uh, and now it's basically the, the, the idea of getting tattoos and, um, and, and, and Chinatown, etc. is basically a marketing thing for, uh, for Katerdrecht. Rotterdam make it happen. But yeah, I could expect, I'm not sure if something like that also happens in Afrikanerwijk already. You would uh, expect it a little bit because, for instance, there was this uh, senior citizen's home on uh, Afrikaner Plein, so the big square in the middle, uh, this building from the 70s, and they changed it, they rebuilt it, and now it's called African Inn. Uh, and um, it is done by Vestia, as you see. This is uh, one of the Vestia guys. And what are they saying? It's, uh, this building is a, is a solid proof that this uh, part of the city is uh, again um, yeah, developing and um, transforming in a good way. And it's been, I'm not sure what the amount is, but it's uh, apartments in the, what they call vrije sector. So it's expensive apartments. So there's, there's some of the, of the seeds of uh, expats and, and more expensive yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And then this is another project, Huis van Zuid. It's a combined uh, community center and sports center, uh, which will be built on one of the uh, empty lots. Well, it's empty because it was, uh, what was there was demolished. So there is uh, all these uh, steps are being taken that go into a certain direction. Parkstad, the part of, on the east side, uh, now looks like this. I think this hasn't been built yet, but this is the kind of uh, architecture and, and uh, yeah, also the groups of people that are being addressed now. There's one of the CPO projects that has been built there, which is um, a CPO, do you know what that is? Um, it's uh, a group of people that um, are united and then collectively design and build a project so that, uh, without a developer, so that they get more uh, value for money. Sometimes they have something uh, in common, but not always. And um, yeah, and this is also, this is on Afrikaner Plein also. You can see there's uh, some new buildings already. And uh, this is a very typical building, uh, rather nice, I think. It says honor qui honor. Uh, it means uh, honor those who should be honored. And then uh, it has these, you see the portraits? That's again uh, Paul Kruger, uh, Cronier, and Christian de Wet, so the, the three uh, Afrikaner generals. But I think uh, this has been uh, torn down and replaced also. So it's going in a very quick pace. This, uh, because from what year was the one on the left, more or less? Was after the study did you do that? No, I, th I think it's from 2007. Then it was already there. Uh, Yeah, and then um, 
Of course, the, the whole contested part uh, of it focuses a little bit on uh, Twebos Buurt. Uh, it, this is Vers Beton is a good go-to magazine if you want to get uh, detailed articles about um, gentrification, also Afrikaanderwijk. Uh, here it says, what price is Rotterdam paying for um, the promised um, yeah, gentrification on south? And they call this gentrification, they call Bakfietswijk. And Bakfiets is uh, one of... Huh? Cargo bike. A oh, cargo bike, yeah. Uh, it's usually when you see uh, a mother going to school with uh, two children in this uh, thing, that's a Bakfiet. So it's, it's become the symbol of the, the well-to-do uh, or hipster culture. And then um, I think it's interesting to yeah, look at it from both ways of the discussion, because um, on the one hand, uh, it's very clear that this uh, demolishing of social housing and building uh, uh, more expensive housing is a form of gentrification because it pushes out uh, the existing population. And I would be very interested to know, for instance, the people from the Twebos buurt, uh, there's more than five or six hundred people who actually lived there and had to move. Where have they gone? Because there's no other houses in the direct neighborhood. So uh, I would be interested to know, uh, did they, yeah, did they stay somewhere in Rotterdam South? Or the word is that they actually uh, were forced to move out, uh, yeah, even out of Rotterdam. So that they ended up in Spijkenis or Hoogvliet, Vlaardingen, Maasluis. This is a little bit, then Rotterdam is becoming a little bit like London, for instance, where people from the old areas are actually yeah, moved out completely uh, out of the center. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure how to find out. The, what was the guy again, the photographer, his Florian. name? Florian. He um, uh, will give us the name of the, the postbode, Ahmed who lives in uh, the Twebos, uh, who still lives there. Maybe on Wednesday we could, uh, or you could visit him and talk about this aspect, like where are, where are all these people? Because I think that is something that was completely not done in the 70s, 80s and, and 90s, was that um, urban renewal would lead to the displacement of people. They would always be offered uh, uh, another apartment or house in the same neighborhood if they wanted, and for the same price. So, uh, and that this uh, whole uh, strategy has been, yeah, forgotten. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's really a shame. That is also why the UN even um, told Rotterdam that this policy for Twebelsbuurt was really uh, against the human laws. Human rights. Human rights. And I think, uh, yeah, but so one thing is, uh, like it says here, uh, be very careful with the uh, social networks and the informal patterns that have emerged over time in neighborhoods like this. And don't just tear down houses and, and re displace everybody. Especially in the Twebelsbuurt, there were people who lived there for 70 or for 50 years. So people were really uh, stuck to that uh, location. So it was not really a city of comings and goings, I would say. So the, the, that's something to keep in mind. Like there is also this uh, core of um, uh, Dutch people that maybe they are the left behind people, but still, uh, yeah, I would like to know if they are still there or where did they go? How do they think of the, uh, the changes in the, in the neighborhood? Um, I actually heard that today the last few people were, uh, well, not evicted, but are, were moving out of the Fables group before they did. So I, I think after today there's no one there. Yeah, this Ahmed is apparently yeah, uh, still. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if he lives in a house that is going to be demolished, but he knows everything about it. So that is one, it's like uh, one, one position, it's like it's uh, anti-social and uh, against uh, human rights. The other uh, thing that I came across, it's a few years old, but um, is interviews with people also in Afrikaanerwijk who said, uh, 
we rather have gentrification than have again another uh, telephone shop or uh, phone shop or, or hairdresser. And these are people that um, actually applaud the uh, influx of this hipster culture even though they say like I'm not going there to buy coffee because it's too expensive I'm not going to this gallery because I'm not interested in art but they still applaud the kind of change of atmosphere that it brings so uh, there's I think that's also very interesting because maybe not all amenities have to really be for yourself uh, that you can uh, actually appreciate them it's like maybe in my neighborhood uh, I have all these um, Antillian, uh, Brazilian, Cape Verdean shops where I don't often go to, but I still appreciate their, them being there. So why not the other way around? So I think we should also try to um, yeah, loosen ourselves a little bit from the, the two polarities in the discussion and uh, from the um, uh, judgment like this is really bad or this is uh, necessary. But just uh, look with an uh, open view and see if we can find some narratives that we don't know yet. Yeah, so let's see what I wanted to... So, yeah, I think what we should look at, um, so the general question would be, um, uh, yeah, to use this update of the 2007 inventory to um, give a general, uh, to, to look at the question, is Afrikaner uh, like a front line of gentrification? And um, uh, how does it show? Does it show in uh, the kind of shops that are there or the amenities or the services? What ethnicities can you find in the in neighborhood now? And what backgrounds do people have? I mean, it's also very different if there are EU workers or international students uh, or Syrian refugees. And yeah, have new groups come in? So uh, um, I showed that it was uh, first it was 34% of Turkish people. Um, is it still the dominant group in there or yeah, have all these um, uh, other groups changed? The demographic makeup of the of the area, and also, um, yeah, probably with these new groups that have come into Parkstad, I'm sure that these are well-educated and more uh, uh, affluent people. They own their own house, etc. Uh, um, so, how do they use the area? Do they actually shop there, or are they more connected to the other areas in Feyenoord, which? because they're sort of in between. And uh, how are they perceived, or th things like that. So, and now it has become a city of comings and goings because of all the uh, demolition and the new buildings. So what effects does it have spatially, but also psycholog psychologically on the people who live there? And when you go there on, uh, well, of course, you can probably find something on these uh, things in, uh, uh, in, the com in the internet tomorrow. But then if you go there on Wednesday, it's also the day of the market. So I think that's an excellent uh, uh, day to talk to people. And uh, well, interviews is maybe uh, a word that I shouldn't use because it um, suggests a very um, uh, profound approach. But you can actually talk to uh, people and ask them uh, uh, things um, about this whole uh, working and the functioning, the programming of this area and how, they, how people perceive it. Um, so what I think, so tomorrow desktop, then on Wednesday interviews, so the one quantitative and the other qualitative. And what I imagine to, that you should have in the background of your mind while doing this is that um, on Friday, uh, what we could all combine your uh, insights or questions or um, uh, results in is a kind of a newspaper. Um, to make a sort of a newspaper on this um, topic, which is very um, yeah, 
actual relevant. Um, and that could consist of, um, well, of course, it should have an editorial uh, stating a sort of a summary of your findings that we should make and write and, and then uh, publish. It could also have articles, it could have uh, pictures, diagrams, um, cartoons, whatever you'd like. But I think this uh, format of the newspaper would be, uh, gives a direction into uh, how to communicate your findings. Yeah, and then um, today, like I said, I would like to start with a tour uh, to um, uh, go there, meet at uh, metro station Rijnhaven, and then um, walk for about an hour uh, so I can show you the different spots that also were part of the presentation already, but then we can uh, but, yeah, look at it uh, collectively. And um, then after that hour, you would take these uh, drawings. And I'm very interested um, to see what will come out of it if we uh, separate you in, well, maybe two groups. Is that the idea? Yeah. And then you could... Um, Look at how does this, uh, how how does does the program, how has it changed for the last uh, 15 years? And now, of course, including also uh, this part, which was not even on the map then. So that's the idea. That's the plan. What do you think? Maybe it's, maybe it's also good to add that on Wednesday. Quite a famous market in Rotterdam. It really attracts people from all over the city uh, because of its diversity, actually, of products that they sell there. Um, so, in that sense, it's also an interesting space because I can imagine that even people that have been kind of moved out to other places in Rotterdam still come back to shop there uh, during the market. So, and, and the hypothesis is also a little bit that there might be some shops in the area as well that still have a have uh, are, are catering for people that, that have already moved out of the neighborhood or that are still owned by someone who actually doesn't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. the shops in that sense, the shops in the, the market, the bars, are a good source of information because, well, hopefully we find out after this afternoon that there's also some kind of stability in them or at least a stable factor that, that hopefully the people behind it can explain something about what they've seen happening uh, in the neighborhood. Yeah, and it could also be that, uh, the, yeah, the one that you mentioned is like in 2007, we found this paint shop where they were selling uh, paint to paint your houses. And it was a, a shop of someone who didn't live in the neighborhood anymore, but who, who was part of this uh, white flight in the 70s and moved to, I don't know, Baardrecht or one of the peripheral uh, uh, municipalities but still had the shop and also his clientele was uh, uh, co still connected to, uh, to him, even though they didn't live there anymore. And I could imagine that also some of the migrant stores uh, are not purely connected to people living in Afrikaanrijk, but uh, are maybe also connected to the larger uh, communities that they are part of. That often happens. Um, there's one really good bakery, I think that's Moroccan and people, I'm not really sure how it has uh, developed, so we should look into that. Yeah.